A little Gergi 1970. Hey everybody, it's Anne. Welcome back to Reaper Toolbox Pro Tips. And I hope that on this Tuesday morning, it is not a Monday for you. It is kind of a Monday for me, but I am soldiering on, as they say. How is everyone today? We have Margaret and Gergi and Nomad Zeke and Dragon Eye Miniatures and Stephanie, Mist Imp, Daffod Weir, Numbat, Karinigo, good morning. Image of Betrayal Morning. Hey Jay, good to see you. Could you close the door, sweetie? Thanks. <laughs> I had I had a uh, a momentary David, but we like to keep the door closed so Kiri goes to sleep. Hey Iggy, good morning, good morning, good morning. So we're uh, we're mimicking again today. Time for the romper room greetings. I like to say hello to everybody, although I do remember that now. Now that you've pulled, now that you've uh, pointed that out, David Weir, I'm like ah, because I remember that. I actually remember that show. <laughs> Ooh, thanks for gifting those subs, Numbat. Or actually, a, a tier one sub. Well, good. Awesome. <laughs> Super. I hope you guys are doing good today. I'm a little sleepy, but it's okay. Happy National Pecan Sandy Day, huh? Ah, uh, wow. Now, I was just thinking about making, like, uh, actually, pecan shorties, which are more shortbread, but still very much like a pecan sandy. Because I have an awesome recipe from the uh, the Great British Bake Off that I really love. And I have all the ingredients. So really there's no excuse for me not to embrace National Pecan Sandy Day, is there? Even if it'll be a pecan shorty. Okay, thanks for the double purple hearts numbat. <sighs> Most of my friends are Nomad Zeke, so you fit right in. <laughs> Including myself sometimes. Alrighty, well, let's go over and paint some mimic while we chat, or some sorry, some mocking beast while we chat. So David turned, uh, pointed out to me yesterday that I really should have painted the uh, the banisters or the they're not banisters, they're the the I forget what they're called, the things, the pin pinials or finials or the things, the posts, the bed posts, uh, brass instead of wood, uh, because. Uh, uh, Monday paint along. No idea what. No idea. Yes, I know nothing. Um, all right, so yay. Yeah, Great British Bake Off is, is one of my favorite all-time shows. I'm going to have to go back and rewatch it because, like, David watched it, and then he really loved it, and so he introduced it to me, and he rewatched everything, but it had been long enough that he didn't remember who would win most of the time, so... Uh, I just want to rewatch it because I, there were so many recipes in there that I wanted to try and I've forgotten half of them. And so I got their, um, the big book of baking. They actually have a baking book with some recipes in it, but I'd kind of like to go back and kind of, you know, bookmark, so to speak, write down Google my favorites because a lot of people have done uh, copycat recipes, uh, just based on the information given on the show. Um, so you could usually find a recipe for a great British bake off, you know, X, uh, if you look hard enough or if something, something, uh, 
something similar anyway, right? All right, so Mimic, rawr, rawr, rawr. He turned out really nicely, I think. I like him a lot. He's, uh, he's definitely uh, a good experiment in wet palette blending um, and setting up things very fast. Well, Gurgi, the thing is that I originally wanted to paint a sheet, you know, on the bed, but then I realized that the inside of the Mimic's mouth was the bed, and I was very disappointed. However, there is a flat part of its mouth on the inside down here, and so I think I'm going to paint it like a blanket on the outside and then go to pink on the inside and see how that looks. So I originally wanted to do a blue binky on the bed, um, so I'm going to go for that. I'm going to do a blue and kind of blue on the bottom and then have it fade into pink going up. And the wet palette will be very good for this because it will let us mix things on the fly. We won't have to mix things. See the evil wet palette? It's back. It's back. Because we, I kind of said I was going to use it for this whole beast. So I'm going to get out my big fat brush because big fat brush equals uh, wet palette. Uh, very useful because we're working with thicker paint, remember. So I'm going to paint right over the teeth on this. Um, I am going to mix up, I'm going to do what I didn't do yesterday, which is to mix up some colors on the wet palette. So I am going to mix up um, a softer blue, with a little bit lighter, because I, uh, because I have such a muted brown, I want a little bit more of a muted blue. And you can mute a blue by, uh, or any color by adding black or white to it. Um, adding white will normally give you a still intense color, but I'm adding actually bleached linen, which has a little bit of brown and black in it. So it's going to mute it out just a little more than normal white would. If I really wanted to make this a little softer, I would actually add a little bit of my walnut. Just a tiny touch is on the tip of my brush there. You see it? And just a tiny touch will mute that blue out just a little bit more. Now, this is because there's, you know, there's kind of a rule of if you mute one color, you want to mute all colors. Now, this brown is pretty neutral, and I could probably go fairly bright with it. But I wouldn't want to go like screaming eyeball bright against it, probably, if I'm going to want the, the color to look good against uh, the, the brown of the bed, bed stand, the mimic, I guess. All right, so I've got kind of a muted out, lighter blue. Um, that's nice, Cornico. Thank you. Uh, good morning, Mathophile. Yeah, that's a good idea, Cornico. I'd have to rewatch and make a note of everybody's name. So that I could Google the my favorites. All right, so let's just start slobbering this in. So I'm actually going to paint his gums blue, at least on the bottom, at least toward the bottom of them. Um, I'm going to try to carry the idea that this is a blanket on the bed, and then it's uh, changing to an actual mouth as it gets near the top. And this is actually gonna help me a little bit. There's a bit more mouth texture on the upper part of the mouth here, um, and a bit less down on the bottom. So I'm gonna utilize that and essentially try to start blue and then transition as it goes up. Now, if you were painting this for a very nice uh, thing, you'd probably wanna fill in this mold line. But uh, we are we are demoing on the beast, so he does not get mold line fill. Some of these mold lines you could get, like this could actually be the an actual seam line between the baseboard of the bed and the back of the bed, or the bottom of the bed. So this one you could actually turn into a feature if you wanted. There. Let's get that a little bit out of frame. I forgot to put my brown dark line there between the uh, bed stand and the everything. Hello, 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 everybody. Oh, do we have a Reaper John show up? I'm amazed that he's like not just stuck to um, Path of Exile with all of his might. I suppose he has to work sometimes. Hey, Planer, it's good to see you. Hello, Tree Boots. Yeah, well, this one works, right, Sethany? Because this is obviously the baseboards of the, like, this is the baseboard, this is the headboard, I guess, of the bed. And so this works perfectly. Whereas this one, you can't really do that with. This one halfway across this, this big gap, you'd have to fill it if you wanted this to look nice. Sometimes it really doesn't work. There are, there are very specific times when it does work. Although usually sculptors these days are good enough that if they've studied mold making at all, 
they'll make the cuts in very clever ways so that running across something like this is actually very um, rare. Usually they'll try to blend in the cut with something else. But sometimes when things also go over to, to China and get cut up to be put into a plastics machine, we don't foresee how that's going to happen too. So you never know. I doubt that this is a line that was made by one of our people. I, I think that probably um, they just didn't know they were going to have to cut it there. But yeah, if you buy a really high quality like uh, model these days, and most of our dragons, you know, and stuff like that, the organic shapes, um, you'll find that it's all very nicely cut so you don't have any of those awkward cuts that you have to worry about. Ah, this just, this line does not want to, does not want to work with me today. It's one of those. Morning, HM Road Dog. Good to see you. There. I am a little bit sleepy today, but I'm soldiering on. And the the mocking beast is fighting with me. It doesn't want me to put a nice dark line here, even though lining is a thing. And I want to do it. So I'm just taking... And this is kind of where this particular brush uh, excels. This is a Raphael 8408. This is not my usual company or my usual series. Um, not my usual brand. But the reason this brush is very good for wet palette is that it has a big, thick body. So it'll hold a lot of paint and keep it wet, even if the paint is thicker. But it also has a razor sharp tip. Like, look at look at that serious, serious tip there. So I can use it for something like lining or fine details. I can do eyeballs with this brush, um, even though it's huge. So this is kind of a, a good brush. If you're looking for a good all-rounder and you use a wet palette and you use thicker paint, the Raphael, it's a Kalinske sample still. It's a high-quality Kalinske. Uh, as you can see, Kalinske, France. So... 8408 is the series. The size is one and it's Raphael. So I, I very much do. It took me a while to get used to the Raphaels because of that, that dichotomy between the heavy body and the, the razor tip. Um, it, it's possible that you use too much glue, Gurgi. If you use a lot of super glue, um, less is more. So a tiny bit of super glue is going to work better, um, than a, uh, large amount. And then the other thing is you may want to pin that area. You may want to do pinning, which I actually covered, gosh, not long ago. What, what was it? What was I pinning guys? I don't remember, but I actually did an episode where we pinned something. And pinning, if you really need to need something to stick together, pinning gives the glue more surface area to cling to, and it holds the piece on, so you don't have to. Um, I I like Zappagap actually. I'm a fan of Lacazette. I use both Loctite and Zappagap depending on what I am gluing. So I doubt it's the Zap unless it's an old bottle. If it's an old bottle of Zappagap, then it probably is has lost some of its adhesion properties. I do find that it gets a little bit weaker if it's really old. Um, you know, I can do eyes with it. It's, it's, you know, yeah, the tip is a little bit soft for it. It's not as good as my, um, my, in my opinion, not as good as my Da Vinci Maestro for that, but I can, right? That's, that's really the point zero is you can do anything with this brush really. And it might not, re it might not do it, it, some of the fine detail things as well as a shorter brush that gives you more control because a shorter brush will do that. That is one thing about length of brush is also important as far as functionality. So a shorter brush is going to give you more control um, there's less wiggle, right? There's less wiggle room. You've got a big, long brush. It's going to have a lot of wiggle. Um, and if you have a shorter brush, it's going to hold together much more firmly. But the point is more that if you have only money for one Kalinske sable and you tend to use thicker paint, um, this is good bang for your buck because it's a very good top quality brush. It's got the ability to do almost everything. Yeah, the turtle lantern. Yeah, so pinning that uh, that thing, Gurgi, you would essentially hold it in place so you don't have to and give your glue time to set. And uh, if you have a little bit too much glue, use like the edge of a Kleenex or something and take some of it off. Yeah. 
Um, I have not seen the Kalinske miniature paintbrush Kickstarter. Um, I, I'm not a big, like, I don't run, run out and like grab like new, when new Kalinskis come out. All right. So here's the dealio. When new Kalinske sables come out, they're really all just using the same stuff. Kalinske sable comes out of Russia. It is, it is then crafted into brushes in various countries. The only difference between one Kalinske sable and another is going to be the length versus width ratio and how good the tip is, right? It, it's all, they're all hand, most of them are hand put together. So, you know, the manufacturing uh, protocol is going to impact the brush as well. But that means that usually I don't run out and just try a new Kalinske sable if I'm really happy with the one I've got, because it can't get better than a grade one Kalinske, which is what I already use. Raphael and Da Vinci are both grade ones. They both have um, the length to width ratio I want, and they're both very reliable. I, I very seldom get a bad brush out the gate with them. So I'm reluctant to go and just throw money at a Kalinske Sable Kickstarter because they're not going to be using any different materials. The only thing they can vary with is if they're doing an unusual new shape. And even then, I'm like, well, you know, I guess. I mean, if you can't find the shape and the... And the type of construction you like, if you like, if you're still looking for the Kalinsky sable for you, then yeah, it might make sense to do the to help the Kickstarter. It also might make sense if it's a real good deal, right? If you just want to get some more good brushes, and so you're gonna, you know, take a take a gamble on a Kickstarter. Um, I, I'm not as inclined to do that. I already have brands that I really like. I already, you know. Um, I don't mind paying money for them. Um, I'm less likely actually to throw money after a Kickstarter where it might be a brush that I really don't get use out of or like at all. Uh, it's like Rosemary and Company. So many of my friends really like them. I've only used one. I really probably should order another just to try it out. But the one that I used, I didn't like. Like I didn't like the width to length ratio for what I was doing. Uh, and it wasn't any better than the other brushes I used. So yeah, to, that's my opinion on brush Kickstarters. Now, given that, I have, like, changed my mind on Kalinske Sables before. Like, when I first tried the Raphael, I didn't like it. But I've gotten to understand, like, better the kind of different qualities of different shapes and everything these days. So, all right. So we've got kind of some blue mocked in on our Mocking Beast mouth. Rosemary, like, but Rosemary can be good for lots of different things, Dragon Eye, right? It's not the brand that makes your brush good for lining. It's the shape. So... You know, it's like if you use your rosemary for lining, that implies to me that you have a rosemary that is that has a shape that's very good for lining. But so does my Da Vinci. So then, you know, why will I run out and buy a rosemary if I already love my Da Vinci? Unless it's super cheaper, which it is, right? But I also have to order it from England, which is more annoying. So, you know, that's probably why I haven't done it. So sometimes if a brush is really different in shape or I get... I hear a lot of reports of different, you know, everybody just loving it for this or that. Um, then I might try it, but depends. Depends. Ah! I do, I am the kind of person who has a lot of brand loyalty. Um, that's also worth mentioning. So that may be another reason I don't like go running around trying all, all the different stuff. Uh, when I find something I love, I stick to it. Yeah, yeah. Got one to test, right? That's what I would do to Dragon Eye. But yeah, I do. So yeah, especially the hobby business where so many of these companies are small, right? They're not like huge companies. Oop, I got some blue in that. And now I got a purpley color. I was trying to mix my mouth color. Instead, I got purple. Well, I need some purple anyway to blend between the, uh, the sheets color and the... Uh, top of the mouth. So we can do that. Let me add a little bit white. So I'm mixing some colors here. I'm mixing, um, I just grabbed, all of these are, are not actually clear brights. They're actually like kind of off shades. So uh, once again, we have just what I had to hand. I, I wanted a red, yellow, blue. This is what uh, the first things I grabbed. So I just put them down. Uh, Fresh Blood 9279, which is a nice, um, if you need a bright, brighter red uh, and you don't like clear red, try Fresh Blood. Um, NMM Gold Highlight for my yellow, softer highlight. I wanted that because usually, uh, mostly I was using it for highlights on the wood, and uh, since it's a softer yellow, it does that well. And then Cyan Blue, which is a slightly greenish 
blue that has a lot of intensity and pretty good coverage, as you can see. Uh, let's see here. Oh, wow. That Kickstarter has got about 500K, huh? Well, they don't need my money then. <laughs> yeah, I wonder if they're ready for it. That's always my always my wonder when I see these uh, these companies that maybe aren't huge, score a big Kickstarter. It comes with so much baggage. I wonder if they will survive it. Although I guess there's a lot more help now. Now that Kickstarter's been around, there's a lot more help out there as far as resources for handling your Kickstarter and getting you know, keeping it together and not losing your your butt <laughs> on your Kickstarter, right? All right, so I'm gonna block in some purple back here near the blue, and then I'll uh, I'll blend the two since I still have both open. I just need a short transition area. I don't so much mind that I'm going purple toward the back of the mouth. That's actually pretty okay. Um, and then we'll grab our little blue and we'll do a little blending down here toward the bottom of our purple area to get it to go a nice transition. And it's nice that this brush is long here because I'm trying to paint way back. So it, um, it helps, helps to have a longer brush that still has enough body that you can uh, dab it around and blend with it and not crush the tip. But yeah, I find the Raphael's very versatile. There. Now we've got some blending going on with our purple purple mouth into blue. Do a little bit more. And then we'll blend our purple up into pink. And since we're using the wet palette, um, of course all our colors are staying nice and wet even if we only have a small amount of them mixed up. Uh, all the brushes in the Kickstarter are made by Da Vinci. Very nice. Well, it's good that they went big then because Da Vinci doesn't want to uh, brand something unless you do a minimum order. So. That said, um, I've worked briefly, I worked very briefly with the Da Vinci people um, just talked to them a bit when Reaper was looking at their getting our Kalinskis set up and uh, they're nice people. They they're, seem to be very willing to work and explore new uh, new angles for selling their brushes. And of course I'm such a Da Vinci fangirl so I just love the quality of the brushes. Still makes me wonder how they're different. Like why, you know, my first question when I see a Kickstarter is why, you know, why do you think the world needs a, needs a different brush? Do they have a, those of you who have looked at this Kickstarter, is that, are they giving a reason? Like, it's like, we want to make more affordable brushes, or we think that we could do a slightly different shape that's interesting, or we want to do a different shaped barrel or, you know, is there a reason that they're doing a Kickstarter for brushes? Or is it just a company that uh, decided that it needed brushes to go with its other product lines? I'm not familiar with Squid, so. Gonna get a nice strawberry pink going on here. That's actually a little bit bright though, I think. Hmm, we'll see. Let me, let me blend it with some purple here. I actually want um, a little bit more of a fleshy color, even though I'm a little bit bright primary right now. So I'm probably gonna uh, take this pink down a bit. When you're doing monster mouths, actually the best colors, like if you don't want to mix anything, reach for Old West Rose. Uh, I think it's 9283. Don't remember, but it's one of those uh, Kickstarter colors from a while ago. And the Old West Rose is uh, very similar to the um, Antique Rose triad that was canceled a long time ago. And what it is, it's, it's, a, it's a more, it is more of an Antique Rose. It's got a bit of brown to it. And that is really the best color to use when you're doing the inside of mouths. Because if you if you look at your own mouth, it's not a screaming bright bubblegum pink, right? You have a little bit of fleshy color in there that comes from, you know, your skin being kind of yellowish at base. Um, and so that being the case, it works much better if you take your pink color and mix in just a tiny bit of a brown to soften it down, remember you're muting it, right? This is yet another way you can mute a color. And add white, add black, add gray, or add brown. Um, all of these things. 
will necessarily mute a color. And you just pretty much add brown until you hit something that you think looks good. So now it's a little bit more dark. You can add a little white to it. And it's going to be a much softer pink now. It's not going to be, let me see if I can get that. There we go. See, it's not bright bubblegum pink now. It's not that color anymore. You can see the difference. Um, and this is a much more natural color. It's going to look more natural. It's going to look more organic, more like it actually belongs on the inside of a living thing's mouth. So I'm going to use that up here at the top. And the other way you can get a really good color for this sort of thing is to mix red into a skin tone. So if you've got something like rosy skin, you can mix a little fresh blood into it. And that can also give you a good muted, because you're, you're taking a skin, a skin, right? And you're making it just a little bit more, you know, blood circulation, adding blood circulation, uh, the illusion thereof. And uh, that's what you're getting in your mouth. So it works. So we're gonna blend the outside here, grabbing some of my blue and blending it with my pink to kind of make it work together. To make it look like one is magically transforming into the other. Oh, we've got way too blue here. Wow, there we go. Now you can see, yay. Oh, and now we need to get some in focus going on. There we go. I'm holding it up higher now. Oh, they have busts. I have ordered so many busts recently, Numbat. I really cannot even. I cannot look at any more. I have so many to paint. I have so much to do. <laughs> I do love busts, but, um, but I've gotten, we got uh, recently my uh, Dark Sun order came in. I'm waiting on something from Chimera Picasso. Uh, you know, I just got that awesome Templar bust. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm, I've got enough. I, I really do <laughs> for now. Uh, but I've got two busts that I'm almost done with, maybe three actually. And so I need to finish those and then I can start a new project. 40, what is it? 54 for four brushes. Yeah. No, yeah, if it's shipping from Europe, I mean, you got to yeah, Real Cheapy Army, I, uh, this is my experiment. If you watch yesterday's stream, you'll see that I decided to uh, use a wet palette because uh, every once in a while I kind of just feel like pushing myself to do something different. Um, and so I thought that since this was a, this model seemed really good for it, I was planning on doing a lot of wet blending on the spot. I was uh, planning on using thicker paint to try to paint it a little faster. And all those things to me fit in with um, with the wet palette very well. So I am wet paletting, and right now I'm doing a mouth, and I'm trying to do it in a little bit more of a muted color because the initial color was way too bright. Hello, dog father. Yeah, you'd have to go back and watch it. Uh, I did like awesome blending on the the mimic wood, as you can see. All of this brown was done yesterday. So, so that's the other thing about wet blending and about working with a wet palette with wet blending is you can set things up extremely quickly. And that lets you get to the fun a bit faster if you uh, consider base coating and setting up your initial layers a pain in the butt. Base coating is the most boring part for sure. I need to mix up more pink. This is the downside. Now I need to mix up. See, and for those of you who use wet palettes, this may be your, uh, and who have not liked them much, this may be your sticking point, right? Is, uh, well, I mixed up this color, then I ran out of it. Now I need to remix it, you know, and it may not be an exact match and all the, I mean, it can happen with well palette too, but well palette, you're usually working with pretty big puddles if you're making a mix. So it's unusual to run out of it unless you uh, can't preserve it and it dries out or something, you know? But I mean, it's not that big of a big deal to remix because usually you can get close enough. Like these two colors, not an exact match. Like I can see that just with my, my paint eyeballs um, that are used to looking at, you know, paint mix, mixing paint. Um, so this one's a little bit more dark and a little bit maybe more grayed out. And this one's more pinky, but you know what? It's going to be close enough because when it comes down to it, when you're just mashing it into a monster mouth, it really doesn't matter. 
and toward the back I'm going to mix in more purple anyway because I want a darker shadow here at the back of the mouth. We'll go quite dark with it, but first I want to get this pink all, all down. Uh, nobody is as calming as Bob Ross, right? I get called the Bob Ross of mini painting, but I really can't aspire. Uh, pricing accepted. Thirteen dollar bust and thirty or thirty bust and thirteen brush. Yeah. Free masterclass video. Coffee. <laughs> Hi, Crowley hamster. Hey, Bob Ross opened the door to all of us art Twitch streaming video people because he was the person who who proved that even if you're not an aspiring artist, it's fun to watch an artist work. So that's we, we owe a lot to Bob. And and even people who weren't at all interested in art liked to watch his show because it was like magic. And those of us who were interested in art liked to watch it, you know, for both reasons. Because we're artists and because it's magic. Getting my blending going on here on the side of the mouth. So I've got a pink to blue transition for the bed sheet versus actual mouth of the mimic. Doing pretty good here. All right, I'm gonna grab some walnut and I'm while I've got the, the back of the mouth wet, I'm gonna make a really dark space back there for his gullet. So you have to imply that he can actually swallow people. Oh, this mini, yes. Aw, oh, he's so cute though. It's a cute bed mimic. He's just gonna eat you and all your stuffed animals. So remember when you put a dark color, especially in a shadow place like the inside of this mouth, it really helps create the illusion that there's just a gap there and it's just a dark, dark shadow. So here by painting in our walnut back in the back of the mouth here, we create the illusion that there is a hole there. Maybe the illusion won't hold up to, you know, really close scrutiny, but at least when you look at the monster, you get the idea. Rar, rar. You also have to say a lot of rar. It's not. Yeah, it's still the bed. Mockingbee sings. Maybe he's singing. I don't know. He looks like he might like death metal. I, I can't think. I don't think he likes like folk music or anything. Or maybe he's just a hard rock kind of bed mocking beast, you know, maybe he's into Queensryche or, you know, maybe he likes the oldies. Yeah, this would be a fun diorama with a kid hero, right? Good, good idea. You obviously need to do that, Crowley Hamster, for uh, ReaperCon next, uh, maybe for this ReaperCon. We have time. It's still summer. Got like, what, three months? Three months to put together an awesome diorama with the bed mocking beast? And now you've seen me paint it, so... Let's see here. Let's do some teeth. I always block in my teeth dark first. Usually I use walnut, although this time I think I'm just going to go with russet. We'll, we'll try it out. We'll try it out with russet. I usually go walnut because then I can leave the dark brown right down at the root and make the teeth uh, show up better. And I might do that down here on the bottom to really make them stand out. But up at the top... I'm going to try just going with russet instead of walnut. I also think it's a nice yellowish brown to make teeth look dirty down at their roots. I'm going to grab some of my bleached linen. Bring those teeth out. Rawr. So we're painting fast today. We want the mimic to be on the table 
I mean, fastest relative, right? I don't paint anything in 30 minutes. I just wouldn't enjoy it. And it wouldn't turn out well. But by the time we're done with this, this mimic will be about two and a half hours. And he'll be passable. Probably better than passable. He'd be better than most gaming models that I see. So again, doing some wet blending here on the side, grabbing some of my bleached linen, smooshing it together with the russet brown. I'm leaving the brown at the root and lightening the tooth as it gets toward the tip. Rawr. Let's see here. Oh, that's right. They're not released yet. I forgot that. Yeah, the Kid Heroes are one of my favorite parts of the Kickstarter. Just really awesome sculpts. bottom teeth uh, figured out here. Decided to just go with russet. I may regret this not starting with walnut thing. Usually because the reason I would start with walnut in this is that walnut is my lining color, right? So it's much easier to paint the whole tooth walnut and then just leave the walnut at the very bottom than it is to try to come in and line every one of these teeth with walnut later, right? So I had, I would have a lot higher, like here's the walnut, you know, it's very dark, but it makes a much better liner line right at the bottom of the tooth. I guess while I have this russet, I could just take a little bit of walnut and kind of paint it, kind of blend it at the base. That would give me a good shadow and I can just still wet blend over the top higher up on the tooth. But you can see how, especially once I highlight these, you'll see how having that walnut down at the bottom of the tooth really makes the tooth stand out a lot better. Sometimes we have resin copies early, but yeah, I don't know. Um, they probably wouldn't want to make a, the thing is that once you do it for one person, then, you know, that opens, that it sets a precedent, so. The answer is likely no. But you never know. It never hurts to ask things. It never, never ever hurts to just ask. You should never be afraid of asking just, just in case of the no. It may be a very, very long shot, but. Getting some more light color on the tips of these teeth. Boy, he's got dirty teeth right now. This is something where I'm using a wet blend to set it up, but if I was gonna finish this model, I would go back in with thinned down paint with my finer brush and move more slowly and, uh, and refine these teeth so that they're uh, tighter. But this is a good, this is a good setup. It's, uh, it's all right. So you can kind of see how the teeth stand out more at the base here than they do up here because I use that walnut, I have that dark shadow, so they're gonna stand out better. At least wanna get these teeth kinda of mapped in, then we can do his eyeballs. But yeah, I mean, once I get these uh, these teeth set, the rest of these teeth set, and then to his eyes, I mean, he's pretty much an awesome gaming model at that point. I mean, I haven't even highlighted the blue blanket at all. 
But if he was a gaming figure for the tabletop, it's like, he'd still be awesome. This is, I like this, the wet blend finish that I've got here is kind of the way that I would paint a, um, a gaming figure for like a board game. Like I painted a couple of figures for uh, Descent back in the day. And this is kind of the quality level. that I would like for those kind of things. Maybe a little bit of highlight on the blue would be nice. So the thing about the wet palette is since I'm working with full strength paint at, over over bones because I'm essentially blending my base coats, um, this is where the wet palette's very nice because thick paint in a well palette, even if you fill the well, is going to dry much faster than it will on, obviously the wet palette will keep it wet for a very long time, hours uh, more if you put the lid on, although I don't ever because my wet palette is so, so uh, ghetto that I lost the lid. Actually, I lost the main body of it long ago, so my sponge and thing are actually in the lid. Um, I used my wet palette so little that I have just had half of a wet palette for a very long time and haven't cared to, uh, fix the situation. I don't know that I would use my wet palette at conventions, though. I, the lighting can be so dicey. I don't think I'd be pleased with anything I did at a convention if I was using a wet palette. So I tend to be very, I tend to use a lot of wet blending. It's so easy to just have it look very bad if you uh, can't see very well. But it's good for this. It's good for this. It's letting us get this mocking beast done really fast. Without wasted paint or paint drying on our palette. And since I'm not, you know, putting down a whole bunch, I'm not using triads at all, it's also encouraging us to mix. Never a bad thing to get a little more comfortable with mixing. And when you're wet blending like this, you really, like as I mentioned with the pink, you really don't have to worry about whether your colors are exact matches if you have to remix a color. Because when you're wet blending like this, it's um, everything is just kind of smooshed together. The eye is not going to detect a little bit of difference between one color and another in this kind of situation. And even if it does, if it carries artistically, it doesn't matter. In other words, do not overthink it. Squash your inner perfectionist sometimes, guys. There is there is a time for the inner perfectionist, and it's when you're like you know, at the end and you're fine tuning and you're like, okay, how could I make this better? Then you can let your inner perfectionist out of their box. But when you are in the middle of painting, do not let the inner perfectionist out of the box. It's like when you're writing, you don't let your inner editor out of, until the novel is done and like, you know, gone through again, and then you need to fine tune it. Then your inner editor can come out and be as critical as they want, as long as you still keep writing and editing. But you don't want them out early on because they can keep you from finishing things, so. Don't, don't overthink it, forgive yourself and allow yourself room to grow, even if you make mistakes, especially if you make mistakes because everybody does, including me all the time. Let's see here what we got. Do, 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 do. Moonlit figure sometime in the future, huh, as you go. Something I have not yet tried. That would be uh that would be great fraught with peril episode because you know well you you guys know though that I, I guinea pig all the time for you. Like a lot of stuff that I do on my Patreon and on here is stuff that I've never tried before. I just decide, let's do it. Um because once you get your toolbox fairly well saturated, 
you really can do anything. Like you just have to spend some time looking at examples and studying what artists say about doing it, you know, and in the, in the case of Moonlit, there's a lot of resources out there. Weren't, I think David was just looking at James Gurney's blog the other day. He was talking about Moonlit figures and how artists have depicted moonlight down through the ages and what color moonlight actually is versus how we see it. There's some fascinating stuff out there and you can utilize this, right? And you should look at some examples of how like canvas painters have depicted moonlit scenes, right? Because you can use that. And there are also some excellent, um, you know, uh, examples done in our, our medium, the miniature painting medium. Um, it is a very popular thing. You see it usually paired with firelight um, in order to get that great kind of blue orange contrast, but not always. Hey, we're almost, we're, we're setting up here. His, his teeth are brighter on one side though. He's like, maybe he's been chewing bones and polishing his teeth on one side. I probably should fix that. But yeah, I mean, once you know how to blend, once you know how to layer, once you know how to texture, once you have a understanding of basic understanding of uh, technique and what works for you, moonlit is just color, right? It's what color you're using. How does moonlight affect underlying color? Are you going to have another light source other than moonlight? You know, um, things like that. But it's mostly concerned with color. And then what sacrifices are you making? If you do an entire model as moonlit, it's going to be very monochrome because you know, it's dark out. You don't really see a lot of color under the moon. You might kind of, your eye might see suggestions of it or might fill in the blanks if it knows what color a thing should be. Cause you know, our eyeballs, our brains are a constant filter um, over what we see. It's, it's that famous example in drawing class where they put a carton of eggs uh, in a still life under a red light, but you still see, like your eyes still see the eggs as white, even though there is no white to be seen. Um, yet your brain still interprets it as white. So everything you see, especially in moonlit scenes, is being kind of, your brain is trying to interpret it for you. And sometimes that makes it hard to convey moonlight in figures and paintings. There we go. Now we got some bright, shiny teeth, bright, shiny teeth. Alrighty. Let's do some eyeballs. Oh, let's see here. At this point, I guess it's uh, that time of day to, uh, plug my Patreon. I noticed I got a couple of new patrons in the last couple days. Thank you guys. If you're on, I know a lot of people see my show, um, on YouTube, on Reaper's YouTube. Uh, but I appreciate every one of you. You really are keeping me going. Your, your, uh, the Patreon is, uh, is my main source of income now. So it's really awesome when I see new people pop up there and, uh, I try to email everybody individually. So check your email for your Patreon because I may have sent you a message. You may not have seen it. Um, I usually ask people what they'd like to see. If there's a particular color they'd like me to cover or something like that. And uh, my Patreon is patreon.com slash painting big. And actually I just uh, shot, finished shooting a video for it yesterday and I'm uh, editing to that to put it up for my $10 tier. It's going to be on weathering cloth, making cloth look faded and also um, making it uh, like showing dirt, or, dirt or mud effects. So that's a fun one. I've been wanting to do that for a while. So I'm underpainting the eyes in white. And then I'm going to ask myself, do I want a glowing effect maybe? Um, so let's see, it might be hard to get this to go on a wet palette. Let me see if I can thin down the paint enough. What color should our eyes be? I'm kind of thinking green. Right now we've got the red and blue thing going on. Could be yellow too. Any, any preference on eye color for Mimica guys? Could be green, red, blue, yellow, anything. Hey, Freely. Really. 
Yellow for Kuroniko. All right, we can do that. Let me get my lantern yellow. So very saturated color, but with an, it's a small area. So all the things I'm talking about where I muted my blue a bit and I muted my red a bit and my pink a bit because this, uh, this brown, although very neutral, is also muted. Um, when you, you can violate that rule about if you're going to mute one color, mute them all just at least a little, uh, if you've got a very small color and usually we call this an accent color. So accent colors, you can go brighter because they take up such a small area that they're not going to fight with anything around them. I'm going to use some lantern yellow here. I'm going to keep it pretty full strength because I want the eyes to, uh, pop out. Don't know if I'll be able to do glowing. I'm going to try it but I want to get the color down first. So we've got some nice, and I can decide, does that stand out enough? And yeah, I think it does. I mean, it suffers a little bit because I used a yellow to highlight the wood. So it doesn't stand out as much as it might, right? Um, if I had gone green, that would have been a better contrast. Red might've fought with the pink being so close. So I wasn't inclined toward red. We can try to see if we can get the yellow to work. I mean, the yellow is going to work, um, probably be easier to fade into this wood color if I do a glowing effect. Um, orange and brown are not complementary Nilock. Actually, they are the same thing. Um, brown is muted orange. So it's actually an analogous color right next to each other. This is a little bit of a yellowy brown because I highlighted it with yellow and I'm going with an orangey yellow for the eyes, which is lantern yellow. If you want an orangey yellow, go lantern. Uh, I think I need some pure white for this one. Get some pure white on my palette. So actually the, um, the complementary color to this brown is actually the blue, which is why they look so intense next to each other. Let's see here. Complementary member means across the color wheel from each other. So and then I bring in a little bit of a highlight by mixing my lantern with white. In order to do a glowing eye, you really need to make the center of the eye lighter to make it look like it has a glow to it. And if you can go pure white with the glow in the middle, that's even better. Cause that makes it look very bright. So just like a little dot, if you can get it to go. And that'll make it look glowier. Now we do the glowing effect from that. So um, to illustrate what I'm talking about here with the color wheel. So, okay, we've got our oranges, right? Um, adding black to orange equals brown. So that makes orange and brown pretty much the same thing. Um, it's just, this is a muted, it's been muted by adding black. And you can see red orange when you mute it to add white actually makes the skin color. So that's one of the uses of the color wheel. Um, I talked about this, I just put out a video the, about this for you 10 or $5 people on my Patreon, how to utilize the color wheel for this. All right, let's see if I can thin down on the wet bed. The wet palette is not well suited for this sort of thing, for smooth blends. Um, I get very frustrated with it often, but all I want to do is kind of block it in and kind of have it work just quick. So I'm going to make essentially a bit of white first, lay down my glow with a thinned white. See how I'm picking up the bottom there. And then it's also going to affect the underside of this brow ridge. Like it's actually not going to be on the top of the head because if you look at it, his brow is actually overshadow his eyes. So the glow is going to be on the underside, which can be difficult to convey. You want to put the light right up next to the eye on the top because we're going to glaze that with yellow and then it's going to fade out real quick. And I'm also going to glaze over that line and then around the eye with the yellow when I do it to try to uh, 
minimize that line. Don't want to paint right over it. I still want it kind of a shadow to be there to define the eye. Let's see. So just kind of blocking in a bit of this. One thing to remember is that the glow is going to be brightest right next to the eye. So you can put a little bit of a line of pure white right there, right around it. And that makes it look glowier, see? But then as the light, depending on how much these eyes are glowing, and I'm gonna say not too much. Um, so this is almost good. I just want a little bit stronger glow going out from that line a little bit to make it blend. So as the glow goes out, it dissipates very quickly. So it isn't gonna go very far. And as it spreads out, it's gonna be a lot more subtle. So it'll be much softer out here and the white will be much stronger close to the eye and that's what we've got. I maybe even went a little bit far down here. We'll see after I glaze it in. Grab lantern yellow, thin it way down, do a glaze. You can always build up more, you can't take it away. So if you're doing this, be cautious. You don't wanna just make it look like a paint can splashed all over the place. It's best if you can see some of the underlying color of the object through the glaze. If I put it on and it's too strong like it was there, this is, this is why wet palettes can be a little frustrating on this, I throw some water on it right away. And then I just paint it all over the place. And grab some more water, squeeze my brush out. And I wanna take all this excess off of here. Just wick it away. Gonna have to go back in with that. My yellow just was, yellow is a lot stronger than you think it is when you thin it. Uh, you'll think that it's gonna be completely see-through and instead you'll get streaky and much harsher than you expected. So yellows are weird that way. It's like on one hand they don't cover and on the other hand when you need them to not cover then they wanna have a little bit of coverage. Yellows and oranges act the same way. Waiting for that to dry before I try to do this again. Need the surface to be dry. Don't want to throw a bunch of other stuff at it. Going to paint this yellow over it again. I thinned it a bit more this time. Tuning, um, tuning paint thinness I find to be difficult, more difficult on a wet palette. So there, and I'm going to bring some more yellow down here. Thin it just a bit more. Remember, if you want to thin the paint on your brush, just on the fly, you can just drag your brush tip a bit over the wet, over a blank part of your wet palette. It will pick up just a little bit of water off the surface of the wet palette paper, and it will thin it down. Getting that down to a precise art takes practice and like just being very familiar with your wet palette. So now we have we have glowy eyeball. Just a little bit of glow. So that's cool. Now we'll do the other one. Remember, start with your white. Put kind of a fade in underneath the eye. Grab kind of some thicker pure white. Do the underside of the brow. Get really close to the eye because your light's going to be strong right next to it. You can put a strip, a thin strip of pure white right under the eye as well. Eyes are a good thing to start experimenting with glowing effects because you always have a backdrop, right? You always have the face of the figure um, to experiment with glowy effects on. So when you are first starting learning OSL, doing glowing eyes is one of the ways that you can start fairly easily. It can be a little bit interesting and counterintuitive because you have to think about the brow ridge and the fact, like I said, this eye, he has deep eyes that are inset slightly and the brow ridge overhangs them. That means the light is not gonna be on top of his head at all. Uh, at least the light from the glowing eyes. So 
you have to it, it this kind of thing makes you think about things like that and that kind of thing is what you need to think about if you're going to do osl you need to be conscious of where the light would actually stretch yeah getting my paint down to the right consistency on wet pellets is always a bit of a pain for me that's why i tend uh whenever i need to blend i do not reach for a wet pellet and this is why this is why I feel like there's just some things that wet pellets are very good at, and there are some things that well pellets are very good at. And uh, that's why I think it's advantageous to painters to try both, to work with both, till they can really understand the strengths and weaknesses of the different tools and uh, settle on what they like or what works for their style. A little bit more. Yeah, who knows though? I mean, I can I can paint a lot faster with a wet palette, so I suppose I could use it more often on the stream, but then I wouldn't be able to demonstrate as well thinned paint techniques um, like I usually can. So I probably will just, maybe I'll introduce it more regularly just to get things down and then uh, go to well go to well palette. So there's our setup for the eye. Thanks, Gergi. Um, it's relative. Also, remember, Dogfather. It's um, it's relative to how they're judging as well. Um, like it is, it is who's judging. It's also like the methodology, like, um, the Reaper open has a definite, uh, system of criteria and some criteria are weighed higher than others. So depending on the category that you were in specific criteria would weigh heavier with the or heavier or lighter with the Reaper judges. And then bombshell, uh, Patrick's judging mostly, you know, uh, what he and Vicky really like. Right. So I think it's less arbitrary in ReaperCon than perhaps is, uh, is the perception is. But I also agree that different judges may have different opinions. And we do everything we can to make sure that everybody's on the same page. But the, because each judging team is judging a different area, sometimes one person's gold, low, one person's low gold may be another person's high silver. And that's why it's uh, good to always get the feedback after the competition to find out exactly what it was and what their thoughts were because you may have been only one point away from a gold with your silver and maybe there's a specific thing they were looking at that bombshell wasn't you know and, and having all this feedback is good don't just judge your metal do talk to the people find out like why they really liked your entry with bombshell find out why maybe your entry was maybe a little weak in its category or not as not as gold i guess right um but i always i mean that's why we set it up this way that's why we actually enable yeah inara um usually if you're in bronze and you aren't quite silver it's blending and tightness um usually like usually what def what def what separates me if I'm looking at a piece as bronze or silver is, is was there an attempt made for highlights and shadings and, and blending appropriately? Like some, obviously sometimes if you're doing textures, it's not appropriate to blend smoothly. Right. But you know, and did you, is everything crisp? Are, are the details kind of, you know, standing out well, you know, how's your brush control, you know, stuff like that. Um, there are a lot of different things and it really, it does vary a little bit between judges, but in general, that's what I find is uh is the line for me oh that's a bummer in our yeah when your vision starts like i feel that right because i had lost my close-in vision when i turned shortly after i turned 40 and my warranty expired and uh, i'm lucky in that mostly it's fixable with glasses but i do still find that maybe i feel like i'm not as sharp right like maybe i need better magnification and if you have a like astigmatism or something, then it can be really challenging. So I, I feel it. That's rough. 
best thing to do then might be to just get uh, a paint painting buddy who can point out things to you. Because if they see that the blending isn't as good in this area and you can't see it, you can still glaze to try to correct it. I had a friend who was colorblind and he would just double check his choices with his painting buddies. Like, and so they could correct him and help him. Uh, Cause he just couldn't see, he had yellow interference colorblindness. So if anything, if yellow was mixed with anything else, he had a real trouble seeing how bright, like greens, he couldn't, he had a hard time seeing like shades of differential in greens as far as brightness or darkness. Or uh, muted versus bright, saturated, sorry. Messing around with this, trying to correct it a little bit. Because it's a little more yellowy on this side and it's a little more white on this side. Uh, the scores aren't posted. You have to ask Daffodware since you're, since the ReaperCon Open is an in-person. After the award ceremony, you go up to the table where you entered your model, and Debbie and Mengu will tell you what um, what judging team judged your model. And then you can go up and, uh, and get direct feedback then, or you can just make a note of who they are and seek them out the next day. Often we're very busy, obviously, right after the competition. A lot of people are trying to get feedback, especially if they have to leave early in the mor next morning. So, um, I like it when people seek me out on Sunday because then I'm usually, I have, I've slept <laughs> and it has been, uh, usually, you know, quite a, um, a harrowing, usually we stay up late Friday night judging really late. And, uh, and then, you know, I'm, I'm involved with the competition. So I'm, I'm, I'm doing the award ceremony. So I, I go through a lot on Saturday that tires me out. Uh, so Sunday is really the best day to grab me if I was on your judging team. There we go. I think I want a little bit more. I got a little bit too much of this dark stripe still on this side. So I'm going to put some yellow on it to kind of fade it out and make it look like even if he has a dark outline around his eye, like he's got his skin there is dark, uh, there's still yellow over it. So it's not as, not as harsh, right? Yeah. So there. So now we have little yellow glowy eyes. Rawr, rawr. When I do glowing eyes also, I like to not put a pupil in them. Um, it just, it allows me to use the center of the eye for that really light uh, pinpoint of white that helps carry the glowing effect. I think it's a little bit harder. Um, not impossible, but a little harder if you've got a pupil there, if it's of any size, because it, uh, it'll be harder to convey the glow where the glow is coming from. You'll have to telegraph it all in where you put your, your outer lighting then. Hey Rings, how's it going? Uh, it's, I do, it can't be anonymous because we need a way to tell whose entry is with whose entry. Um, for sure. So that's, that's the problem there. I mean, we could go to maybe numbers, all that makes it a lot harder since we organize it with C, you know, by, by, by alphabet, alphabetization of last names. Um, however, do keep one thing in mind, Dogfather, and that is that there will always be sour grapes people who will claim that there is bias. As a judge, as somebody who has judged painting competitions for over 20 years at this point, I try extremely hard to not bias myself. And sometimes the perception that there will be bias is so strong that I have had somebody come up like somebody who I awarded something in a painting competition has actually come up to the person running the competition afterwards, shocked that I had awarded them first place because she and I didn't get along. So don't, there will always be that perception that there is bias based on, oh, this painter is popular. These painters are friends. These painters don't like each other. But be aware that we take this very seriously. We all try to put aside any bias we may have. And as we're working in a team, we judge it very objectively. We're talking about technique. We're talking about story. We're talking about execution and con and, and composition. Um, I, I don't, I mean, I'm usually stuck with kind of the same group of people, but even in walking around and listening to teams, I don't hear bias. So, and I'm a stickler about that. I try to be very objective. So if I heard it, I would not like it. There is taste though. There's definitely taste. Yes. David brings up a good point. So there are definitely like people like different styles, right? So if you have something that's got super smooth blending, 
it's going to, you know, I'm going to look at it and go, oh, nice. They, they executed that well, right? Because I like smooth blends. Whereas somebody else who might be really into texture is going to be a little bored by the smooth blending and say, well, they could have done more there, right? So you do get that. You absolutely do get that. Um, and you also get biases, uh, like some people really like muted colors and don't like bright. Some people like really a lot of saturation in the mini and get bored with a lot of muted. All this kind of thing. Some people like harsh light, harsh lighting. Some people, you know, like more diffused. So yeah, you do get that kind of thing. I think you get that in every art competition. Yeah, it's unavoidable. Yeah, it is. <laughs> Xander Klee's rigged. <laughs> uh, let's see here. Whoa, 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 whoa. Yeah, yeah, you get to see the end results uh, rings of the uh, the mimic with its uh, its blue to pink mouth. Although I didn't, I did, I will say I wanted to put little yellow flowers on the blue bedspread, and I didn't get to that. <laughs> I didn't get to highlight or shading the blue at all. But then you guys wanted glowing eyes, so I thought that was higher priority. But look, guys, like we painted in about two and a half hours, thanks to the wet palette and a lot of wet blending and a lot of fast painting, you know, and the fact that this enables this, we have painted an entire mini and actually finished it. It helps that the Mimic is largely one color, right? That definitely helps. If this was a mini with lots of different fiddly bits, it would have been a lot harder to speed paint like this. But we, we did it, and it was partially our brush and partially our wet palette that helped us do it. So that's why I say, when you hear me say, I like wet palettes for speed, this is why. Yeah, yeah, Dogfather. Yeah, that's always the case. Like We have an in-joke about that. Where it's like, you will spend, like, you will put up a mini that you've spent blood, sweat, and tears on. And then you'll just kind of throw in another one where you're like, eh, you know, I may as well put this one in too. And they'll choose the second one to judge. Like, it, it always happens. It happens to all of us. <laughs> the model that we think is better, the judges think is better. So the best you can do then is just ask why. You know, there's always a reason why they chose that model. And I mean, we choose the model that we think we can score the highest. So that, that is the rule. But yeah. Well, right, exactly, Dragon Eye, right? We try to, um, I mean, we do somewhat have to put judges together for qualifications. For example, in the Ordnance Division, um, Chris Marquardt, Heisler, is almost always one of the judges. When Justin McCoy comes, he's one of the judges. And that's because those guys do high-level, um, you know, military planes, tanks, cars, things like that. Like, they, they are very familiar with the techniques, um, and so they're very qualified to judge, and so that they know what they're seeing, right? They know what they're looking at. Uh, so, and, and likewise, with the open division, um, we'll usually throw Derek Schubert in there because he is a sculptor as well as a painter, right? So he's going to be able to more, be more qualified to judge that. But we try to also balance out the judging teams a bit. It's always, it's so hard. I mean, Michael Proctor does a fantastic job of putting together the judging teams every year. We're still reaching prefer perfection. I mean, there are some teams I think are very well balanced in the spirit of the competition. And, you know, but we're also always having new, new judges come in, right? That we've, we've usually, as painters come in and teach at ReaperCon, we'll often pull them into a judging team so that they can judge along and learn the system. So it always is going to vary a little bit. Oh, Kuroniko. Yeah, I wouldn't get nearly as far. The, the, the well palette encourages me to slow down and do things very, and it's just the way, it's like psychological for me almost, the, the well palette. And I, I slow down, I enjoy the process, I try to make it nicer, I'm working with thinner paint, I have to hand mix, you know, all my colors, you know, and stuff like that. Um, it would let me get a lot better texture on the beast, less, less like kind of just mocked in. Mock, mocked, mocking beast, oops. Um, but uh, it would also take a lot longer. So I think it would probably take me at least an hour longer, maybe two hours longer. Um, it would be prettier and it would be tighter, but it wouldn't necessarily be done. <laughs> so, you know, so I can totally, uh, I'm glad I did this because it did get me like to give the well the wet palette. But the great thing about doing this for this stream, guys, is that as I have to explain to you why I why I'm uh, having success with the wet palette, or maybe why it's frustrating, or maybe how it's helping me, or how it works with this brush, having to analyze that for you guys helps me kind of like set that in my head. Also, right, um, opens my mind to considering it because because I have to ask myself, well, why. You know, I have to explain this to everybody. So why? I have to figure it out. And so it helps me understand 
my biases toward and against the wet palette to talk about it with you guys. So this is extremely useful. It's an extremely useful tool. Uh, the whole show is for me as a painter when I have to like throw myself at something like this and go, okay, let's really break it down. Why do I not like this as much as I like the well palette? What is it good for? You know, can I change my mind about it? Um, because I don't like to get too, st too stuck in my thoughts. I like to be more open-minded. So this is why I test myself like this. It's always good to do this as an artist. Always give, even if you hated something when you tried it three years ago, give it another spin because you're going to, you're going to know more. You're going to be more conscious of why, of the why of things. And that's always useful. And sometimes maybe you'll change your mind and that maybe that'll be like a revolution for your painting style. Right? So always push yourself. Oh, Hey there, everybody. And that was, I cannot see your name with that pale blue. Oh no. Person who just came in double seven. Or 07. <laughs> Hello. I just finished painting this uh, this bed mocking beast. So it's actually a bed that's trying to eat somebody. Prefer probably the kid adventurers from Bones 5, but we don't have those models yet, so we can't do a diorama. We're very sad about that. Have I done an episode of the bone painting tutorial? Oh, bone dragon. Oh, dear. No, I haven't. I've been looking for the right... Uh, the right model for painting bone. I mean, painting teeth is very similar in a lot of ways. I use the same type of colors usually. Um, but painting bone on 28s, you really don't, I mean, you can do stuff with it. Uh, it's usually you need to notice the grain of the bone. Maybe I'll try to, I might have something that's bony around here. I'll have to look, I'll have to look for a good subject. Yeah, exactly. 07, right? It's like, it, it changes. It changes with your, with your painting, what style you enjoy. It, sometimes it, it makes painting fun again to switch it up uh, and try a different brush, try a different palette, really just try to work it and see what's good at, what it's not good at, how, what you like it for, maybe a different thing as to why somebody else likes it, right? Yeah, right, Max. And and part of that is is uh, trying the well palette again when you've when you've disliked it in the past. Part of it is uh, just knowing what it's good for, right? Knowing how to use it. Use deeper paint puddles. You know, thin your paint a bit more. It's good for great thin. It's great for thinned paint applications, but the wet palette excels for thick paint applications. Yeah, well, whatever works for you, rings, right? Uh, do I have a human size mini? Yes, but it's not Reaper, so don't be horrified. Here, we'll get uh, Dark Sword out. We'll get Dark Sword guy. Okay, so he's a little bit taller. Dark Sword tends to be a little taller than your average Reaper model. So Reaper model probably comes up to his chest a bit, uh, most Reaper models. So drag it here. Let's have him actually fighting the Mocking Beast. Rawr, rawr, rawr. There we go. Rawr. A fair bit of bed. If if this bed was stretched out, uh, Dragonborn would be a little bit a uh, little bit cramped. But then they are taller than humans, so. But yeah, so there you go. There is a and that's a dark sword, um, Dragonkin Rogue, I believe. Really nice model, Jeff Gray sculpt. Really nice. We are uh, painting that Dragonkin for our uh, fifteen dollar um, tier paint along on my Patreon. It's funny, Inara, because I actually set out to try to influence that a while back. Um, when I started analyzing, because everybody I knew used a wet palette, and I was really just frustrated with it because I, I really felt that the well was a lot stronger in, in some ways, and I felt that people were having frustration maybe with learning to do smooth blends because they were using the wet palette and the well was better at it. Um, and so I kind of set out to try to change people's minds about that by using a well palette a lot. Um, I will still say both, they vary, they're, they're, you know, they're very different tools and they do different things very well. Um, and so, you know, your mileage always may vary with any tool. Yeah, it's scale creep. You can talk to Ed about it. Ask, ask, there's a great one for Reaper, Reaper live this week. Ask Ed to talk about scale creep in the industry. Have him talk about how Reaper started out at like 25 millimeter and how people measured it differently and, you know, and how the creep has affected the industry. Because uh, 
I, I, we used to talk about that a lot when I started at Reaper because a lot of our early models are true 25 or at least they're 25 millimeter heroic. Um, cause you know, it's, do you measure to the top of the head or do you measure to the eyes? That's a thing with scale. So some models are using a 28 millimeter scale that measures to the eyes, which is called 28 millimeter heroic quote unquote. And I think Ed actually created that term. I think Reaper actually pioneered that term. So when you see heroic scale miniatures, they're usually referring to a scale, but they're measuring not to the top of the head, but to the eyeball level. What is the well palette? Oh, let me show you my well palette. This is what I usually use, 07. And it is a well palette ceramic, so it's porcelain, from Cheap Joe's Art Supply. Uh, I believe we even have a, a, a Discord command, uh, or our, uh, sorry, our command here on, on Twitch, a Twitch command that uh, gives you the link. But it's great because it has 28 wells, and they're tiny. Like, they're much smaller. Like, if you get one of those big, one of those round flower palettes, it's like that. It's got like six or seven wells, and the wells are much bigger. These are useful because they're smaller, so you only have to use six or eight drops of paint and then a bit of water. And because it's a deep, small well it'll stay wet for hours. Like it, it keeps the paint at the right consistency. And you can mix up real thin to paint, a lot of real thin paint. Like if you need a lot of wash or you need a lot of glaze because you're working on a bigger model um, or you just want it to be open for a while so you can mess with stuff, you can do that in this and it'll stay wet for hours. Like I, I use one of these at Paint Club, at Reaper. I used to do four hours at a time. And maybe once during that four hour period, I might have to add a little bit of water to my paint. So this is a really nice, really nice palette. And because it's porcelain, as you can see, it cleans up almost perfectly. Like there's a little bit, I got a little lazy when I cleaned this one. So there's still a little bit of paint, but you just put it in the sink with some hot water and a little bit of like 409 or method or whatever cleanser you've got access to. Let it soak in the hot water and cleanser for maybe two to five minutes. And then a green scrubby pad will take it all right off. Maybe even a fingernail. Like sometimes I don't even use the green scrubby. Uh, so it, it makes the palette stay nice and clean, and so it still repels paint. The problem with plastic or metal palettes is as you use a scrubbing pad to scrub them out, you're abrading the surface. That actually gives the paint more area to stick to. So that's why plastic and metal palettes just accumulate paint that dries and will not come out over time without a lot of elbow grease. Sometimes with plastic, it won't come out at all. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. When you've got six, then usually they're bigger wells. You can see that my thumb fits like this is, this is my thumb and it fits inside one of these wells just perfectly. So that's the size of well. And because it is a smaller well, less surface area is open to the air when you mix a puddle of paint in here. And that, that lower surface area, when it's a bigger well, there's more surface area, right? And the more surface area you have, the more evaporation you're going to get. So little surface area, little wells, this is the way to go when you're miniature painting, in my opinion, if you're trying to do smooth blending or very thin paint applications and you want a consistent consistency of paint that won't change much over time for like working an hour or two hours or more. Um, you can keep this wet overnight by putting a couple of extra water drops like up in an area you're not using or around the area you're using and just using cling wrap over the top of it. I've kept it uh, for up to three days that way. So you can actually preserve your paint if you're in the middle of a project and you don't want to lose the paint that you've mixed, you can do it that way. So that's, that's my baby. I work with this. I am considering starting doing, um, s starting a minis with this and then maybe moving over to this for refinement. Uh, we'll see. I don't know. I'm trying to switch up my style lately. I'm trying to get myself out of a rut. I have so many beautiful busts that I want to paint and I want to try different things. So I liked being adventurous in this hobby. It's fun. It, it keeps me excited about the hobby. Yeah, well, these are cheap. Believe it or not, 07, uh, if you order these from Cheap Joe's, like, they just had them on sale for, what, five bucks? Uh, and usually they're around ten. So it's it's really not expensive, and it lasts forever. As long as you don't drop it on a concrete floor, you're good. Um, so uh, I have very inexpensive. I mean, it, you'll save money in the long run, right? This, this palette is probably a decade old, maybe more. So, uh, considering, uh, depending on how often you have to reorder your 99 cent or buck 99 palette or rebuy it, you know, I probably save a lot of money over time just having one of these. Also, to be frank, I hate it when my palette isn't clean. So porcelain is the way to go for me. Like I'm just, I'm anal that way. I want the white sheet of paper. I want to start totally clean and then mess it up. 
Oh, oh, nice, Lebrowski. Okay, so the palette I just showed you, if you go to Cheap Joe's Art Supply and look for the 28 Well Porcelain Palette, is still five bucks. Only five dollars. I'm seriously tempted to go and buy a bunch of them and then sell them if I ever get back to doing classes in person. Yay. Well, Miss Anne? Yeah, I think it's like late, guys. So like, this has been a long stream, but it's fun. Yeah, it's, it's, we've been, talked about a lot. It's been, it's been very robust. Yes, it's a robust stream. We've had a lot of fun here. Let me see here. Let me make a note of the time. Yeah. Sorry. Right. Do you have a raid for us, Justin? I do. We're going to be raiding Jimmy the Brush. Jimmy the Brush. Jimmy's fun. Jimmy's fun. That's great. Yeah. Thanks for watching, guys. I hope that you learned a lot. I hope it's been thought provo provoking uh, to use the wet palette. Like I said, maybe I'll work the wet palette in a little bit more on some projects um, on the stream uh, and just switch back and forth. Uh, and then we can talk about both. So that's always instructive. Yeah, I was happy right. with today's stream. I think it went well. All right. Uh, have a good one, guys, and I'll see you tomorrow. I don't know what I'm going to paint tomorrow. Maybe we'll start on the rock troll. Maybe we'll uh, do basing and maybe do some dramatic lighting on the rock troll. That would be fun. Maybe that would do that. Maybe the maybe the wet palette will, will come back. All right. Have a great one, guys. We'll see you tomorrow morning. All right. Bye. Quick reminder. Um, Clo Crow's Nest will not be airing today because Proctor is camping. Uh, keep being awesome, guys, because at this point, that's kind of our tagline. You know, it's what we share in. Um, we love you. Spread the Reaper love, even. Tell Jimmy we said hi. And I will see you guys tomorrow for more Anne. Best time of the day, right, guys? All right. See you guys later. <laughs>